So welcome everybody to the first colloquium of the spring semester. Our inaugural and guest speaker is Jesse McCarthy, who will be introduced by Ernest Julius Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell is a lecturer in history and literature at Harvard. He is writing a new biography of Claude McKay, which is under contract with Yale University Press. And he's also the editor of a forthcoming edition of Gene Toomer's Kane with Norton Library. He earned his doctorate in the Department of African and African American Studies here at Harvard. And he has just been offered a position as an assistant professor in English and Humanities at the Yale University. Welcome. <laughs> and the podium is yours. Thank you so much, Krishna. Uh, thank you to Abby. Thank you, Professor Gates, for having us here today. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to be here to introduce uh, an in a intellectual uh, interlocutor and a cherished friend of mine, uh, Professor Jesse McCarthy. Professor McCarthy is the Assistant Professor of English and African and African American Studies here at Harvard. He attended Amherst College and received his PhD from the Department of English at Princeton University. His research centers on 20th century African-American literature, but the scope and the breadth of his interests is unbounded, ranging across histories, places, and languages. Professor McCarthy's work aims to reimagine black writing between 1945 and 1965, the incompletely understood era between the black Renaissance and the black arts movement. His work helps us to make new connections between well-known figures like James Baldwin and Edouard Glissant and lesser known figures like Vincent O. Carter who left Kansas City for Switzerland. In his preface to Carter's sardonic classic, The Burn Book, recently republished by Dalkey Press, Professor McCarthy celebrates what he aptly calls the Afro-modernist novel and proclaims his larger goal as quote, to challenge anew our assumptions about the history of black writing, what it has been, and what it may become. His forthcoming academic monograph, The Blue Period, will achieve this goal. Professor McCarthy is also a creative writer. His debut novel, The Fugitivities, will be published in June with Melville House Press. Professor Namwali Serpel has reviewed it as, quote, a gorgeous, virtuosic novel that shows us blackness in all of its inner intricacy, tension, and beauty. Professor McCarthy's work also extends to the world of the essay, he is a contributing editor at The Point Magazine and has published widely in The Nation, The LA Review of Books, The New York Times Book Review, The New Republic, and N Plus One. Today, he will be speaking to us on a topic drawn from his forthcoming book of essays, Who Will Pay Reparations on My Soul, which will be appearing in March uh, with W.W. Norton and company. These essays show astonishing reach and range, really summing up for us Professor McCarthy's conviction, uh, and I quote from the introduction, that nothing is outside of our purview, that there are no limits to the ideas, realms of knowledge, creative traditions, or political histories that we can lay claim to and incorporate. He writes with elasticity, range, and reference, always striving to keep alive the questions, calling us back to the labor and the joy of thinking. It is with great pleasure that I present to you all uh, my colleague and my friend, Professor Jesse McCarthy, with his talk, Venus and the Angel of History. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mitchell, for that introduction. Um, it's an honor to be um, in conversation with you, and I really appreciate um, the introduction, and I'm looking forward to um, you know, our conversation and to thinking through um, this essay and and many other subjects, which um, you know, I must say, you know, have been influenced in no small part by by our past conversations and and ongoing conversations and those that I'm looking forward to in the future. I'd like to also um, take a moment uh, to thank um, all the folks at the Hutchins Center: uh, Krishna Lewis, Abby Wolf, uh, Professor Gates, and all the folks behind the scenes uh, who. Uh, make this work possible in this difficult time and who have continued to provide, uh, you know, a wonderful platform for us to, to come together, albeit virtually, uh, to, to share ideas, to have conversations and uh, to continue the work of thought even under these uh, difficult circumstances. 
So I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin my PowerPoint here so that we can get this started. Hopefully you all can see that now. Um, <clears throat> and as Dr. Mitchell indicated, this is uh, uh, this essay is from my forthcoming collection, uh, which we published in March, who will pay reparations on my soul, uh, which gathers articles, essays, and reviews uh, that really range over the last, uh, uh, I'd say five or six years or so, uh, pieces that really reflect my interest in trying to grapple with uh, the present, the current cultural moment we've been living in, and to always bring into focus uh, the intersection of race, politics, and aesthetics by looking at um, literature, art, um, and other cultural modes of expression. And uh, this particular essay, uh, which is a newer one, uh, was uh, really inspired both by, of course, the work of, of Kara Walker, um, but more importantly, one of, in my view, one of the most important thinkers uh, of our time, and that's uh, Sadia Hartman. And I really wanted to uh, have an opportunity. I knew I wanted at some point in this collection, in this book, uh, to, uh, to engage her, her work and her thinking. And so this was my attempt to kind of bring those things together. So with that, I'll go ahead and begin the talk. This is called Venus and the Angel of History. And the epigraph for the essay is taken from Alice Walker who writes, there are times when normal responses of grief, horror, and so on do not make sense because they bear no real relation to the depth of the emotion one feels. It was impossible for me to cry when I saw the field full of weeds where Zora is. History is something we learn. History is also a current that much of our daily life is designed to insulate us from. Even though it surges all around us, we only occasionally and often accidentally encounter its electric shock. When we do, as Walker suggests in her reflection upon discovering Zora Neale Hurston's burial ground, it often strikes our sensibility by overloading it to a point that can become dissociative, even anesthetic. We cannot register it in the same way that we would a personal emotion. The poet Nathaniel Mackey likens the experience to that of discovering a phantom limb, a numbness that points to a missing bodily member that refuses to be lost. Momentarily in a kind of trance, we inhabit the experience of another's pain and internalize it as our own. Mackey also evocatively describes this process as a kuvad a term for sympathetic pregnancy in men, which sometimes entails a set of rituals that allow a father to accompany the birth of a child as though he were going through labor himself. These attempts to grasp the feeling of history suggest that it is the embodied learning of a vast and impersonal grief or pain of past peoples. We channel loss for persons and situations and aspirations that we have never known an unnerving intimacy with a disremembered and dismembered past. The grain of the unknowing produces a residual irritation, the gnawing tremors of a lack that can be hard to place, one we may even loathe acknowledging, yet it refuses to go away. An instinctual desire for kinship a gift for collective personal belonging tells us that the things that happen to them also happen to us. They are our inalienable birthright. They are about us in an important way. Sooner or later, we discover it is our time, our turn to go in search of our mother's gardens, to discover what grew there that cleared the way for us. Looking down through the generations, we see the crests of epical moments, inflection points whose visceral impact lingers in our nervous system. Think of the news of emancipation carried across battle lines, like sparks from a winter campfire in the winter of 1863. 
Think of Juneteenth and the cries raising up like a summer storm in the Texan heat. Think just over a century later about the news bulletins reaching folks in their homes, in their kitchens, on street corners across the land with the news that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot dead by a white gunman in Memphis. In our generation, we think of election night, November 4th, 2008, the stinging of tears on the brink or already falling, the outbursts, but also the vigilant silence of old folks who explained later in faltering voices that they had to concentrate because they were not only witnessing for themselves, but also for the ancestors watching the moment through them. I remember for the second time in my life feeling that strange telescoping feeling, realizing people would be talking about and studying this very moment for hundreds of years to come. I happen to have been born in time to see the World Trade Towers fall and the first black president rise and take his elected office. Here was another chapter in what Du Bois called the travail of souls whose burden is almost beyond the measure of their strength, but who bear it in the name of a historic race. In the roar of the crowds and in the flowing tears, you could feel it, the awesome shudder of history when it is being made, when it suddenly reaches out and shoves you in the chest, daring you not to react, daring you not to make yourself humble before it. At such moments, we know we are part of an epic, that time is not empty, but pregnant with narrative orientation and disorientation. What are we to make of this epic memory, its haunting and terrorizing eruptions? Who can hold in their mind all at once the seemingly endless disasters, losses, defeats, and almost unspeakable degradations cataloged therein? The fondness of Black parents for Old Testament names is surely one way of inscribing and transmitting a response of prophetic hope across time. The tradition's spiraling return to Black Zionism, to utopian imaginations of Black statehood and Black arcs of deliverance, the fundamentally theological bent of African-American politics is surely another. But hope and deliverance is only one side of the coin. The other is a fatalistic and bewildering attempt to make sense of the fear of the irredeemable, of wasted life, of brutality without compensation, of denigration and dissolution beyond account, some would say without analog, incapable of repair. Black intellectual uh, history has always been in part an attempt to come to terms with a terrifying sense of wholesale abjection. Black life in this country has always been predicated upon and inextricably bound up with negligence, casual violence, and dishonorable death. There it is in the very first sentence of the preamble to David Walker's 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world. Having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States, and having in the course of my travels taken the most accurate observations of things as they exist, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of these United States, are the most degraded, wretched, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. And I pray God that none like us ever may live again until time shall be no more. The signs change, but a pall of negativity connects this appraisal of abjection in Walker to sorrow in Du Bois, bleakness in, Rich in Richard Wright. And one could add today of subjection in Sadia Hartman and in Afro-pessimism, which has flourished, ironically enough, in the shadow of the Obama presidency. Stephen Best has lately diagnosed what he views as the malady of the, quote, omnipresence of history in our politics. A via negativa committed to, quote, the thesis that black identity is uniquely grounded in slavery and middle passage, 
and that what makes black people black is their continued navigation of an afterlife of slavery, recursions of slavery and Jim Crow for which no one appears able to find the exit. Best raises a valid question. Does the past, however traumatic, however needful, ultimately determine the horizon of our belonging? Can it tell us who we are now at this moment and orient us towards the future? Does the shadow of disaster ever finally recede, cease to have the pull on us that perhaps it once had? If these questions seem unanswered or unanswerable, we might nevertheless ask, what accounts for the renewed intensity and urgency of these questions here and now in the first decades of the 21st century? Why at a time when reasonable arguments can be made that things are looking better, does there seem to be a renewed desire to look back instead of forward? Why this enormous reluctance to relinquish the past? Why indeed the countervailing force in the recent decades of a desperate and furious need to prevent the memory of slavery, of slavery and subjection from slipping away. No thinker has addressed the contradictions of this history, the shock and numbness, its pregnancies of meaning and miscarriages of justice, its hold over us and its ever receding wake as incisively and creatively as Sadia Hartman. In her three major works thus far, Scenes of Subjection, Lose Your Mother, and Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, the most vulnerable human being of all, the young black girl, appears everywhere as the plaything of history's imagination. As Hartman puts it in her celebrated essay, Venus in Two Acts, quote, variously named Harriet, Fibba, Sarah, Joanna, Rachel, Linda, and Sally, she is found everywhere in the Atlantic world. The barracoon, the hollow of the slave ship, the pest house, the brothel, the cage, the surgeon's laboratory, the prison, the cane field, the kitchen, the master's bedroom, all turn out to be exactly the same place. And in all of them, she is called Venus. She is also infamously Sarah Bartman, the koi koi woman who was paraded through Europe as the Venus Hottentot, her anatomy quote unquote, studied by their leading scientific minds. Robin Cost Lewis catalogs her many variants in her beautiful poem, Voyage of the Sable Venus. In this way, the real life of Venus is stolen twice over. This is what Hartman calls the scandal of the archive. It's Janice faced role in granting while simultaneously denying us the recovery of the few traces of the past that we have. The archive is in this case, Hartman says, a death sentence, a tomb, a display of the violated body, an inventory of property, a medical treatise on gonorrhea, a few lines about a whore's life, an asterisk in the grand narrative of history. Yet the four opening words of beautiful, uh, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, her most recent and most exciting work, plunge us back into a paradoxical hope. And those first words are, you can find her. Who is she? The answer is both singular and plural, soloist and chorus. She has the countless individual lives of young black women, many of them only retrievable through the case files compiled by New York's Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, where they so often were interned. She is, for instance, 15-year-old Maddie Nelson, who came north in the years of the first great migration between 1890 and 1935, in search of work and ways of life she would have to imagine, since no possibility of them for her had ever previously existed. Hartman's subject is, quote, not the story of one girl, but a serial biography of a generation, a portrait of the chorus, a moving picture of the wayward. This generation's search for new freedom collided with the most regressive and terrifying combination of science, technology, and racist ideology ever openly concocted a period the historian Rayford Logan infamously describes as the nadir of race relations in US history. 
forced sterilizations of black women and girls as young as 12, as Shatima Threadcraft has shown, were common enough in the South to be referred to as, quote, Mississippi appendectomy. And they would be carried on until at least 1973, when the case of Minnie Lee and her sister, Mary Ralph, eventually brought landmark legal action against sterilization abuse in 1970. For some Americans to forget places in the North with names like the Laboratory for Social Hygiene, which operated at Bedford Hills, or the Eugenics Record Office at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, places where men like Harry Laughlin and Charles Davenport developed a racial eugenics program with policy recommendations so repulsive that the German Nazi state borrowed them uh, as a template in their own war against their own undesirables, the disabled, the feeble-minded, as they called them, the Jews. Race science, social hygiene, and the dubious study of criminology were used to tar black immigrant populations fleeing terror, expropriation, and debt peonage in the South. These same tactics were then used to distinguish them from the European immigrant populations flooding into the country at the same time. An insidious statistical legerdemain that Khalil Muhammad has scrutinized in the condemnation of blackness. Hartman's hesitant first person presence within her narrative is intensely reminiscent of W.G. Zabald, that unnerving alloy of fiction and nonfiction, the melancholic mannerisms of someone sifting through debris, speculating in an ex post facto rumination upon the meaning of photographs, objects, and the personal details of minor lives, reconstructing not the scene, but everything in the wings of a historical crime. We have not always wanted to look at these lives or known how to see them. Hartman undoes the erasure of these lives by allowing them to interanimate each other, to reach out to each other across the gaps. They form lists on the page, which are also chorus lines. Muses, drudges, washerwomen, whores, houseworkers, factory girls, waitresses, and aspiring never to be stars. They all, she, uh, Hartman embraces them and in turn, they embrace each other. In her book, they are people again, and they can be themselves instead of the data that someone else's file needed them to be. Hartman is clear about the disillusionment and hurdles these women faced, but she also sees how their collective action and reckless aspiration, quote, point towards what await us, what has yet to come into view, what they anticipate, the time and place better than here. We should not forget that it is the very openness to futurity and incompleteness of history that makes Hartman's acts of redress possible. The cultural historian Carolyn Steedman captures this subtle point well in Dust, her brilliant study of the many uses of the archive. The writing of history, Steedman points out, quote, actually moves forward through the implicit understanding that things are not over, that the story isn't finished, can't ever be completed, for some new item of information may alter the account as it has been given. This leads to the rather startling, if retrospectively obvious conclusion that, quote, all historians, even the most purblind empiricists, recognize this in their writing. They are telling the only story that has no end. The only story that has no end. This means that history has no conclusion that includes the writer of that history in it. But this also means that the writer of history is actively shaping the nature of this past, which has unfinished business with us. Hartman has changed how we will henceforth think about the lives of black women during a historical period we thought we knew fairly well. She has changed the past precisely because that past is not over for her or for us. Our contemporary sense of the past as a site in need of a rescue mission can be traced to Walter Benjamin. 
Why did his theory emerge when it did and as it did? The apocalyptic terror of the 1930s is no longer, to use a term he liked, quite knowable to us. For thinkers in the wealthiest nations today, it is rather rare for work to be produced under threat of imminent political assassination or incarceration. Indeed, the jailing and killing of poets and philosophers from Lorca to Dennis Brutus, which was such a hallmark of the 20th century, has, de has declined somewhat since the end of the Cold War. Benjamin's Über den Begriff der Geschichte, or theses on the concept of history, however, was forged in despair. A series of fragments written shortly before his death by suicide at the Spanish border as he was attempting to escape Nazi-occupied France. One of the last things Benjamin did before attempting his escape was to give a Paul Klee painting he owned called Angelus Novus to the writer Georges Bataille to pass on for safekeeping to his dear friend and intellectual comrade Gershom Scholem, who kept the painting in Jerusalem. In the theses, Benjamin famously describes the painting in mystical terms. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. For Benjamin, the horror of our historical trajectory lies in the angel's inability to close his wings. What prevents that closure is the insistent storm of progress, the stubborn belief of liberals, fascists, and communists alike that technology and rational control are inherently positive forces that merely have to be harnessed to their respective utopian agendas. The political ideology of the modern world, the storm pushing to reach the paradise of modernity's impossible utopias, is in fact violent, Benjamin thinks, precisely because it cannot or will not make that which is truly valuable in the past whole and tangible to the present. The powerful may monumentalize historical icons in order to glorify the state, but this is merely in order to further cement the belief that they are legitimately carrying us all forward into a better future. What they will not permit is any chance for the wretched, for those suffering at the base of the social pyramid to come to know the past that is really relevant to them. The artist, writer and revolutionary anarchists task is therefore to find a way to make the angels wings beat again, to grant the hummingbirds momentum, to still the storm by making something unthinkable happen. This requires the walloping force of a memory's sudden return, like the whiplash of remembering something crucial at the last minute, an event or revelation that will jolt the entire system off its foundations and allow the stage of history to reset with open parameters. A terrifying, but also an ecstatically joyful moment when everything is suddenly possible and the entire social order is thrown into the void of a new beginning. In other words, a revolution. In Benjamin's messianic vision, the only way to save the future is by rescuing the past from the overlords of the present, by fighting against those forces around us that refuse to let the buried rise, to let the ghostly voices be heard. Despite his bespectacled aloof image, Benjamin's rage was immense, Blakean in spiritual intensity and committed to active resistance. No one may ever make peace with poverty when it falls like a gigantic shadow upon his countrymen and his house, 
he says in One Way Street. Then he must be alert to every humiliation done to him and so discipline himself that his suffering becomes no longer the downhill road of grief, but the rising path of revolt. Benjamin was no reformist. He is adamant that the bourgeoisie has to be completely abolished and that time is running out. Before the spark reaches the dynamite, the lighted fuse must be cut, he warned. Benjamin's usefulness for the writing of critiques in the contemporary academy has muted, even eclipsed the theopolitical intensity of this revolutionary anarchism. He has become a kind of Che Guevara for a portion of the intelligentsia that feels it must talk the talk, but cannot necessarily imagine how to walk the walk. We are embarrassed by his ardency, by his conviction that art and politics and history are one, and that getting them right is about saving the world by ending the one we know. Some grumble that his work is too cryptic, but the truth is that his writing is not hard to understand. It is hard to look at directly. His aphoristic fragments singe like solar flares. The only way of knowing a person is to love that person without hope, he says. Who can survive that test? Who today would dare to read Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal or Blanqui's prison writings on astronomy as serious reports on the state of damnation of the modern world? Who is prepared to say that social media, AI, and robotic automation are not just the products of neoliberalism, the society of control, or lack of government oversight, but visions of hell. I'm not saying that Benjamin doesn't see any redemptive opportunities in culture and technology, or that our own speculations on such are not worthwhile. He does, and they are. But it is undeniable that the intellectual culture of the present has come to relish that part of Benjamin's work without committing to or taking seriously his anarchist and messianic call for a revolutionary politics. To continue in Benjamin's terms, if the intellectual classes can stroll up to the precipice and decide it's not yet time to leap, then they will not be the ones to bring the light of redemption to the people. Now, I think it's fair to say that black intellectuals and even those I respectfully disagree with have been more willing than most to steer our way to that ledge, to hold our gaze out over its edge. Now, this makes sense since the people whose redemption we seek have the least to lose. We may be in disarray and disagreement about what to do about it, but at least black studies takes as a basic premise that our society is in a terminal emergency. Yet of all the cultural forces in the social fabric, black intellectuals also tend to have the shortest reach. We're at least allegedly hard to read, hard to like, hard to look at directly, sometimes hard to find at all. Black artists, however, and there's a case to be made that art is the realm of Benjamin's true legacy, are getting bolder and more far reaching with every decade, more willing to force us to look. Consider that extraordinary appearance in 2014 of A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, that modern day sphinx that Carol Walker raised inside the cavernous belly of the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn. The art critic Roberta Smith singled out this installation as easily the most significant work of art produced in the last decade, a period which stood out to her as a new moment of arrival for black artists and black art. The road to this historic commission began back in the early 1990s when Carol Walker, then a student um, at the Rhode Island School of Design began to rethink her relationship to race and representation in her artwork. Walker grew up in Stone Mountain, Georgia and her father, a painter, taught at Georgia State University. Her first years as a young art student were spent at the Atlanta College of Art where she initially conceived of becoming a painter like her father. Against the trends in the art world, she was interested in figural painting and devoted herself to studying the techniques of the old masters of European art, 
But by the end of her MFA at RISD, Walker had made a radical swerve. In her first major show in 1994, she demonstrated an approach she would rework throughout the rest of the decade based on the silhouette effect <clears throat> of cutouts using black and white paper. Jettisoning the frame of the individual painting, she became in effect a muralist, transforming the default white space of gallery walls from a neutral institutional background into a surface of psychic and phantasmagorical projection like the cycloramas of the late 19th century. These works implicitly returned gallery viewers to the position of the leisured spectators of the age of minstrelsy, that antebellum brew of racial masquerade and humiliation, which formed the original Greece that lubricated America's culture industry. The figures in Walker's cutouts are a Rabelaisian parade of stock characters from the American racial commedia. Darkies, mammies, coons, pickaninnies, sambos, tar babies, jigaboos. Like the witty horror in Jordan Peele's 2017 film Get Out, or the trashy fantasies of Bubbles Brazil in Darius James's 1992 novel Negrophobia, their force is due to the legibility that we, the viewers, supply to an otherwise surreal script before us. What's so disturbing in the vignettes is precisely that we recognize them recognize them, that the source of those racial scripts is not Walker's polarized abstractions, but our own heads. It is sufficiently baked into our miscegenated DNA that younger viewers can recognize the characters even without having seen Gone with the Wind, or read Uncle Tom's Cabin, or listened to Amos and Andy. In talks and interviews, Walker explains her turn to the cutouts as a way to deliberately deny herself some of the stylistic presence of her own hand, a rejection of the personal expressivity that she previously thought necessary to painting. But there is an underlying mannerism to her repertory. One never wonders if a cutout piece is by Carol Walker. The sexual and scatological scenarios, like the infernal landscapes of Hieronymus Bosch, are unmistakable at a glance. Walker figured out how to make the cutout congeal into chirography, a signature effect that seizes us and to which we cannot be indifferent. The searing willfulness of this provocation was not greeted without controversy. She had to weather fierce attacks, notably by black critics who accused her of reproducing the worst stereotypes ever used to demean black people. In a powerful essay on Walker entitled, What Do We Want History to Do to Us? Zadie Smith focuses on this iconoclastic quality in Walker's work, holding it up as a beacon, quote, for black freedom of expression itself. For Smith, Walker laid down a fierce example of what can be achieved when an artist refuses to reduce herself to what others demand the role they believe you ought to play instead of the one you feel to be true. I hope Walker is never ashamed to be the wrong kind of artist, woman, black person, or ever exhausted by our endless projections upon her, Smith writes. She is surely right to insist on the refusal of those twinned impulses, so acutely characteristic of our public discourse, shame and outrage. One gift an artist might give to other artists, Smith observes, is a demonstration of how to make work without shame. This is very true. Another gift, or perhaps the other side of this gift, is to help those of us experiencing art to learn the virtues of a more delicate reaction, but one no less necessary or valuable, the capacity for embarrassment. I'm surprised at how little this word comes up in relation to Walker's work. Can I be the only person who feels embarrassed in its presence? Regardless of the racial composition of a group, even in the event, however unlikely, that one is solely in the presence of Black visitors, encountering a piece by Carol Walker seems to me inherently embarrassing. There's no way not to be discomfited by its presence. Any commentary on the work is immediately fraught. 
the evasion of such commentary with small talk even more so. What we ought to do, of course, is laugh. As Glenda Carpio has noted, laughter and humor are essential to Walker's work, though just how much and quite at, one, at what one is laughing are precisely the rub. Is the joke on us, on only some of us? Is the antebellum negress who speaks so archly in the mischievous title cards to the works a merry trickster? Tavia Nyong'o makes a persuasive case there's art world trolling at play in Walker's work that may not always evade. Her sugar baby, he points out, was erected in a portion of rapidly gentrifying Brooklyn and ended up effectively doing a kind of public relations work for the corporations and real estate companies behind that gentrification. Now, I don't deny that there are important and, and possibly irresolvable questions about complicity between art and capital. But that does not necessarily negate or annul the potential effects of the work upon those who saw it, or those who will at least know that it was possible to make such a work and raise it in that time and place. Walker has made clear that she's interested in how people interact with her work. And fortunately, there's a record of the public's reaction to the installation. Walker had her team videotape the reactions of visitors as they walked through the ruins of the Domino factory. Walker said that she was especially interested in the reaction of black visitors, those alone, those in couples, entire families that made the pilgrimage. What is responsible for the tremor, the shimmering strangeness, and discomposure in the searching gazes that they cast upon the subtlety, those bashful deflections, those halting gestures of private response to a public exposure of intimate knowledge. Is art really at bottom a vehicle for our communing around our embarrassments? What, for instance, is the appropriate response to turning the corner at the rear of the factory and having the sugar baby's vulva come into view? I see a wink here back to Walker's early art school days, a memory of Courbet's scandalous L'Origine du Monde, The Origin of the World, a painting that gazes frontally into the sex of a white woman and names her original. In addition to correcting Courbet from an anthropological point of view, Walker restores a historical and material sense to the world. Her installation is very purposefully made of the most profitable of the slave crops of the Americas, harvested on an industrial scale at exorbitant cost of African blood and amassing great fortunes whose capital flowed through the commercial veins of the city at the mouth of the Hudson, where the Domino factory once churned out its highly lucrative and addictive product. What is supremely profitable today, among other things, is contemporary art. How profitable? Well, in 2019, a work called Rabbit by the artist Jeff Koons sold at auction for $91 million, setting a new record for a living artist. Walker's work fetches hefty sums too. Yet aesthetically and more important, ethically, I think they are radically and di even diametrically opposed. Still, they are worth pondering together, Walker's subtlety and Coons's rabbit, because they stand before us like signs at a fork in the road, indicating, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, indicating the options ahead. Both are signatures of contemporary Americana. Neither could have been produced anywhere other than, than in the USA. Both express in remarkably accurate terms an ugliness unique to our culture. Walker's art tells us more than we want to hear about the ugliness of our past. Kunz's Silver Bunny shows us the ugliness of our present. And if we do nothing to alter its course, the ugly emptiness of our future. 
by polishing away any possible connection to the past and glibly seeking succor in false innocence and false universality, Kuhn's has produced perhaps the whitest art, ideologically speaking, not ethnically, that has ever been created. Even the white bourgeoisie no longer finds its shock value palatable. In a scathing review some years ago, Jed Pearl called the Kuhn's retrospective, quote, a multi-million dollar mausoleum in which everything that was ever lively and challenging about avant-gardism and Dada and Duchamp has gone to die. There is no real laughter, no genuine embarrassment to be had in the presence of a Kuhn's. Irritation, indifference, transient fascination, titillation, maybe, but never embarrassment. How could you be? Kuhn's, not unlike Donald Trump, is a pure troll. The artist who sees that in a society obsessed with shaming, the ultimate sign of superiority and success is shamelessness, tout court, and it sells itself. It is the triumph of pure appearance, the art and politics of a deathless, lifeless, narrative-free future. Whether it is capital's concentration and colonization of our private lives or some other force at work, there is mounting evidence that as a society, we are increasingly and collectively fetishizing shame while losing our responsive capacity as individuals for embarrassment. But the ability to acknowledge embarrassment is a precious resource and one deeply related to creativity, to the creative act, whether artistic or political. When cultivated in a poet like Keats, as Christopher Ricks famously argued, embarrassment can lay the foundation for that essential quality of negative capability. Moments of hesitation that extend the pursuit of thought beyond the acceptable frame of our certainties. We think of such qualities as important for poetic thinking, but they can be no less necessary to political and social problems, and maybe even more so. Whatever one thinks of the sugar baby, she is undeniably subtle in ways that Kunz's rabbit is not. She makes us uncomfortable and arouses emotions that his work cannot access or even perhaps remember once existed. The sugar baby signifies effortlessly, not in spite of her faults, but because of them, including her awkward entanglements in the art commodity market. She is full, uh, pregnant, even inflated with embarrassing memories that stir in us as we come into her space. There is a pastness and something very present that radiates from her surreal presence. She is, at the very least, one way of envisioning the angel of history. The angel is not only Benjamin's or Paul Clay's. We have to be on the lookout for her. We have to take notice and speak up when she passes by. She may come in all shapes, sizes, and forms. She often will not and probably should not seek to present herself in ways that will necessarily make us comfortable. But in the last instance, isn't it our mothers that make us feel the most important kind of embarrassment of all? The one that makes us want to do better and be better. Not out of shame, but because we know in their sight that we really are better. If this is true, then allowing ourselves to dwell in embarrassment before our own history, to laugh productively at ourselves and with each other is not a sign of hopelessness. It is a mark of vitality, a living current that only awaits our full acknowledgement and our willingness to be uncomfortable together a little longer than we usually allow. When I say that the sugar baby is the angel of history, this doesn't require that the artwork itself be resistant or that the artist who made her be the agent of our progress and our salvation. The angel or the sugar baby is no better than the rest of us helplessly being pushed by the forces of progress and its accumulated disasters into the future. What makes her different is that she emerges as a towering work that looms for us to see, to look up from our daily routines and interrupt them, if only for the space of a visit. 
If we can do that, we might begin to notice features in her worthy of our greater attention. Like the way Walker's Sphinx speaks to Langston Hughes's lines about those rivers, ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. Or Zora Neale Hurston's line about how the nigger woman is the mule of the world. And what Sadia Hartman tells us about mothers. The slave ship is a womb, abyss, the plantation, the belly of the world. This is the world that the sugar baby looks back upon, the world made by the black woman the one that tells the truth of our past, even when we'd rather not hear it like that. She is also the one who makes possible the work still to be done. Without my mother's legacy, Jasmine Ward writes in her searing memoir, Men We Reaped, I would never have been able to look at this history of loss, this future where I will surely lose more and write the narrative that remembers. What riddles does the Sphinx tell? Does her behind, which might embarrass us upon first discovering it, upon further reflection, inform us that it too deserves greater respect than we have generally accorded it? Or is what matters most of all the direction she's looking in, backward, into the past that made her what she is. Thank you. Okay, let me end the PowerPoint and return. I apologize, went a little bit long, um, but I hope we'll have some time to answer questions and um, I'm happy to take them in any direction we'd like to go. Thank you, Jesse. That was fabulous. Um, Tom, can you um, uh, enable my video, please? Or Krishna? I can't. Um... Ah, there you go. That was amazing. That was fabulous. Um, Thank you. I have a lot of questions, but Ernie, uh, would you like to start? Absolutely. Um, I'll just I'll just try to be very brief um, and maybe leave leave the questions to others. Although I have I have a number myself, um, but I'm less interested in some ways in the argument than in the juxtapositions that you're giving us here. Right. I mean, there's a wealth of different uh, sort of possibilities and directions we can take this. But I did just want to sort of sketch out you know these these big moves that are being made. Right. The sort of the juxtaposition. Uh, on the one hand, right, of Sidia Hartman with Walter Benjamin, right, as like two different but related models for thinking about the past as a kind of rescue or salvage mission, mm -hmm. right? Paul Clay and Kara Walker, right, mm -hmm. as two related, again, but different ways of thinking about what it means for art to turn itself towards the past, right, and for it to be you know, sort of attempting to grapple with that and yet unable to in its fullness. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, right, this third juxtaposition, which, which ends up being emerging, right, uh, for you of, of the angel and the sphinx, right? And these two sort of non-human, um, mm -hmm. semi-divine figures, right? Uh, who converge as also symbols of, of political possibility. Mm -hmm. If I'm, if I'm so far so good. Yeah. Yeah, so I think those are, for me, those are three of the kind of central mm -hmm. juxtapositions that are happening here. And I'm, and I'm really interested in like what, the, what that even does, right? Just bringing these, bringing these theorists, bringing these artworks um, and bringing these kind of theopolitical figures together mm -hmm. is meant to spark, right? Um, and I guess I'm thinking about, you know, for, the, for those, those who don't know, right? I mean, this is, I think we, we mentioned this, right? But this is one chapter uh, out of the forthcoming book of essays. Um, and in the intro to the book of essays, which I'm, you know, everybody go out and buy it, pre-order it, it's already on Amazon. Um, the cover is beautiful also, but in the intro, um, right, you say, you say something that's really fascinating to me, right? That whenever one pushes the possibilities of form, 
right? Something perhaps smaller than freedom, but like it in kind mm -hmm. becomes available to us. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a kind of praise of experimental writing here. Mm -hmm. And that thing that's something, that's something that is perhaps smaller than freedom, but similar to freedom, I think is hope, yeah? Mm -hmm. I think it's hope. Um, and so I guess I'm also interested in, in hearing more from you about the work that hope is doing in mm -hmm. this piece and in the collection as a whole, mm -hmm. right? You know, what is, what is the, the as you call it elsewhere, the paradoxical hope, right? Yeah. That reflecting on the historical um, could open up for us. And also that opening new juxtapositions, right? Between thinkers, figures, time periods, even mm -hmm. disciplines that don't necessarily talk to each other. What kind of hope, what kind of political possibility does that open up? So this is kind of an invitation both to speak on the talk, but really more broadly, maybe to, to say a few words to the audience about um, about the, the book, the collection, and, and how you sort of see juxtaposition, hope, and political possibility operating there. Absolutely. Thank you. That's great. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, when thinking for a moment about uh, kind of the parallels and also the differences in between Benjamin and, and Hartman, um, Benjamin's work and, and project is on the one hand articulated uh, right around uh, questions of the archive, um, infamously in the arcades project and this kind of sifting through um, um, the objects and the commodities um, in, in order to kind of um, reconstruct or, or, or find these um, these elements that that help to to illuminate and to to, to tell us uh, something about uh, essentially the the trajectory of history and perhaps the the, the forces that are um, um, constraining that the, the or the, the trajectory he would like to see um, and therefore the ways in which we might also need to struggle against it and so on the one hand. Benjamin has a project focus, focused on the archive, but then also through Paul Clay, uh, through the, the theses, there's uh, also, of course, very much a thinking um, on, you know, the question of art and the artist. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was kind of draw out what I see as um, some of the implications or possibilities of connecting uh, that site, the site of thinking about art and artists to um, questions of the archive with which City of Hartman is more uh, uh, typically understood to be working, right? And uh, I think actually this, this becomes um, quite clear in her, in her most recent book, In Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments, that um, the return to finding uh, these women, many of these kind of marginal lives brings into focus not only their, um, their, their sort of uh, the, the, re the work of redress, as she puts it, that can be done to recover them uh, from the archive, but also brings us inevitably to consider what they were actually doing in those lives, which was in various ways kind, uh, in, for many of them at least, involved in various kinds of art making, not necessarily in a formal sense uh, sometimes, but, but necessarily with, you know, expressing art, forms of creative expression that were important to their lives, but also important as, as she indicates to allowing people to imagine new ways of life. Um, and to enact, in some sense, those, those ways of being in the world for themselves in spite of and against, right, you know, terrible constraints, right, that, um, that you know, they, they could not in necessarily overcome, but which they enacted regardless, as it were. And, you know, I think that one of the things that um, I'm interested in and that the, the book as a whole um, is sort of marinated in is uh, this kind of tension in between, and this, I, you know, I sort of allude to it and touch on it a little bit through through Stephen Best's book, which is a really excellent book, and I recommend it to folks. The, recommend it, the book None Like Us, um, 
where he he sort of has this a kind of uh, a, a negative view, but I think that he's also thinking about um, this problem of the ways in which where there's sometimes a tendency to think about the problem of slavery of this past that that uh, this kind of crushing sense that it, it's a force of foreclosure, that it's a force of ultimate negation and impossibility. And I think actually that Hartman's work in particular and others, uh, I think of Fred Moten, uh, I certainly see myself as, as thinking that doesn't quite have to be that, that there are ways in which um, the, the kind of insistence on, no, we, we still want to attend and return to this past and we need to dwell in it, is not simply about a kind of foreclosing futurity and openness and hope and possibility, um, but actually that in this kind of Benjaminian way, um, precisely in bringing aspects of the turn to the past, which is also a turn to the archive, and the creative work of the present, which is the work of the artist, when those two things come into contact, as they do, I think, in the work of Carol Walker, um, there's precisely a, a kind of turbulence there, a turbulence that I think Benjamin was, was always trying, in a sense, to articulate, that it, for him, is a positive kind of anarchic turbulence, one that, because it challenges and, and kind of places uh, before uh, the present, before the, the kind of social order of the present, uh, certain kinds of demands, certain imaginations of freedom and possibility that that present order, even if it sort of gestures towards them, isn't yet really <laughs> willing or able to fully allow. But I think that's a, I hope that doesn't sound too convoluted. It's a bit of a complicated thing, but I, but it's true that you're, you're right to point out that, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is in this work of juxtaposition, but I would just say, and this is following also upon Cheryl Wall and, and what she says in her wonderful book, The Will to Adorn, her last book on the art of the African-American essay, that you know, traditionally the essay has been an experimental form in the African-American literary tradition and been a space precisely for us to kind of bring in these juxtapositions and think through these intersections of politics, aesthetics, ethics, um, and so on. Thank you for that, though. Yeah, and so the part of actually the work of, of juxtaposition and part of the generation of, uh, of this anarchic turbulence that you speak of, mm -hmm. that's what kind of creates the possibility for history not to just crush us, right? Right, that there's yeah. something actually that, that opens up, right, through these rewirings that you're doing for us here. Absolutely, and I would say that it, it hinges, you know, in part on, you know, uh, what Carolyn Steedman, you know, points to, I think, very astutely, which is uh, precisely that the kind of um, very vertiginous, I would say, realization um, that history is <clears throat> precisely the one human narrative that has no ending, right? And so foreclosure really at some level, I would say, is, is actually, um, it's impossible in that sense, right? And, and but, but there, it's, it's, it's on the contrary ideology that is, um, interested in placing blinkers on us, that is interested in telling us that certain things are impossible or hopeless, or that we, you know, dare not think, dare not imagine, dare not hope. Um, but it is the, the force of the artist, especially when the artist, and I would say, however we want to think about it, the philosopher, the thinker, the writer, the um, you, the figure that I, that here stands for Sadia Hartman for and, and Benjamin are connecting the the force and power of the past to the creative work of the present and the artist. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, great. Um, thank you, uh, uh, soon to be Professor uh, Mitchell. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I want to go back to that Stephen Best. Um, quotation that you use as a kind of epigraph. Yeah. Um, what is the context for that? Was he critiquing it? Oh, yeah. He, he was saying that, you know, we're stuck in slavery in the Middle Passage and, you know, you need to move on, right? You need to find uh, other foundational metaphors or other scenes of instruction or other um, tropes. Um, can you explain why and then what he 
wants us to substitute instead <laughs> as a yeah. well as, as a grounding as um, um, as one might put it. And the other thing is, why Benjamin? Why Benjamin? You know, yeah. um, a few a few years ago it was Foucault. Everybody <laughs> was Foucault, and then it was Gramsci. I remember I asked right. a scholar once, why Gramsci? And they almost had a heart attack, you know, like, what are you talking about? You know, like you can explain the whole world through Gram Gramsci. And you will always be able to explain the world through Gramsci. And we've been quoting Benjamin since I was where Ernie is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I love reading <laughs> Benjamin. Um, uh, but don't get me uh, be wrong. I, I'm just reading uh, The Age of the Magicians. Mm -hmm. which is about Heidegger and Kassir and, and, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and um, Benjamin. It, it's a brilliant book. Well, uh, but anyway, go ahead, answer the question. No, it's, a, it's an excellent one. And uh, the only thing, you know, I, I want to, uh, you know, just quickly say that, you know, I'll give sort of my, my own best interpretation, but I invite people to read Stephen Best's book. Um, and and uh, because it's a, it's a complex and, and complicated argument, I... I I feel that I, I'm still in a sense, you know, digesting it and making, making sense of it for myself. Uh, what I would say is in, in, in the context that I'm quoting him there, yeah, I mean, that's what he's arguing against. And he's pointing out that there has been a kind of what he calls a kind of melancholy historicism that has been fairly dominant um, in the academy and among black intellectuals um, that he traces back to, um, and, and in a sense, and this is what in part also to answer the question of why Benjamin, precisely to Benjamin and to a Benjaminian um, modality or modality of thought that um, is, you know, he, he, he points out particularly the kind of moment of the publication in, in 87 of Beloved, of Toni Morrison's Beloved, kind of comes to the fore, kind of has its moment and that he thinks in some ways we're still kind of stuck in. And he's you know, proposing, I think, uh, to, to try and help us think our way out of that by, I would say, suggesting a kind of where, that where uh, he thinks we have a tendency to propose a kind of coherent collective subject, a kind of we um, that we, you know, that purports to be the we that is recovered. He wants to say, no, it's precisely uh, that, that that the archive and this history and all of this material that we encounter, what it, what it tells us is precisely the opposite, is that there is no we, that there is no collective subject, but, but that this impossibility or something about the kind of um, uh, the legacy of this impossibility, the kind of woundedness of that impossibility might actually paradoxically still be the grounds for a certain kind of um, project, a certain kind of identification. So it's a, it's a bit of a dialectical move. And again, I want to say that, you know, I'm not, uh, I would, I would, I would prefer to allow him to, 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 to explicate it. I hope I'm doing somewhat justice to it, but that I would say is, yeah, is and that's why Benjamin. And, and I would say, I just want to be clear that I'm hoping in part that what I'm trying to get at in the essay is I, I would like to say, you know, that, um, while I don't want by any means to jettison Benjamin, I actually think in some ways there's a richer Benjamin to be recovered. What I actually uh, would like to say is not let's read Benjamin, but let's read Hartman. And, and that actually uh, Hartman is, um, um, and not just Hartman, I would say, you know, Christina Sharp, there's a whole bunch of, peop of, of, of people and, and folks working in black feminism who are, I think, um, radicalizing a certain kind of, of, of Benjaminian thought and that we ought to um, uh, be excited about that and put that into, and that we can, I would say, put that into conversation with contemporary artistic practice in the work, say, of Carol Walker, uh, but there could be many others. Thank you. Shall we open it up? Yes, um, a couple of really great questions have come in. I'll just read them out to you. Um, William Pruitt asks, many scholars in black studies argue that slavery and its afterlives are no laughing matter. Hartman sees, seems like one such scholar. Others in black studies, including Glenda Carpio, Richard Powell and Rebecca Wanzo argue that humor can be a brilliant way to analyze and subvert slavery and its afterlives. 
As someone who has whose approach is deeply indebted to Hartman's theories, how do you distinguish successful usages of humor from unsuccessful ones in treatments of slavery and slavery's afterlives? Hmm. Okay, that's a really that's a really good question and a difficult question. Um, here's what I would say. Um, you know, I. You know, some of this I think is open to you know, you know, debate because you know you know, obviously questions of personal taste are gonna come into how you, you know, interact with and think about a work of art um, or the work of an artist. Um, when I think about Kara Walker's work, and this is a little bit what I was trying to get at in, in when I bring up the question of embarrassment, you know, when, when we're embarrassed, uh, what, is, what are one of the things that we do, right? We laugh. Uh, which we, we often have a, re, a kind of nervous laughter, right? Is one kind of physiological reaction to embarrassment. I would say that that is, uh, I would argue that that is, that is a right or a good or a positive or a useful generative, um, you know, use of humor, right? Because uh, I don't think that, that the laughter of embarrassment um, is a laughter which isn't also serious, right? Which isn't also, I mean, in some ways, I think it's the most serious one. I mean, it, because in a sense, it implies a kind of helplessness, right? A vulnerability um, to the history. And this is precisely to me, I think, you know, there, there, there is a, a, I think oftentimes in our contemporary discourse, and here I'm not necessarily thinking at all about academic or scholarly discourse, but really just popular discourse, uh, a kind of feeling that the only way to kind of make a point or get through or get someone to react in the way that we would wish them to react is through shame. And that, and, and that out, the kind of dialectic between shame and outrage then kind of gets generated. But I tend to think that actually most people, even if they uh, kind of feel compelled for various reasons to take that approach, I think it's. I think there's there's a a fairly common response to that that also feels fairly um, unsatisfying. Whereas I think that um, you know the laughter of embarrassment um, is more generative and more productive. And so I you know I'm I'm, hes I'm hesitant to go on the right. I know I know the the more brave thing would be to try and and give you an example uh, off the top here about a you know an unsuccessful example. Uh, of humor in relation to slavery. I, I, I don't think I have one right, uh, you know, available to me. And, and if I hazard one, then I'll probably later think, no, I don't think that's right. But I think what I would say in an attempt to, to answer this question as, as, as best as I can is to say that, you know, I think one of the things I would suggest is that the, when Hartman, when Benjamin, do the work of yoking together the extraordinarily brutal, painful material of the archive of the past and of slavery to the to moments of um, kind of inc inc incongruous, seemingly incongruous, right? Moments of levity, of leisure, of flamboyance, of abundance, um, and also just of, of, of kind of haplessness and helplessness of everydayness. You know, everydayness is so important to, the, to, the, to, uh, to, to Hartman. And I think there, there's, that's precisely why, and, and this is one way I would see it as being connected, which is that, you know, in our everyday lives, much of our lives, you know, isn't kind of, uh, you know, theologically serious, if I can put it that way, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's shot through and full of, um, embarrassment and levity because we're, we're, we're because we're human um, and I but I think that one of the things that that is important to note is that you know I really do think that um, Hartman is pointing us to and I think Carol Walker's work points us to a force there that's not simply a kind of again a humor and embarrassment that's simply uh, a divertisement Right. That's you know you don't go before Carol Walker's Sphinx and it's just a kind of wow that was fun. I think there's a 
uh, a seriousness there that forces political questions, and I would say even theopolitical questions, right into into the heart of things, and and that to me is the the uh, the kind of um, force that I'm that I'm really interested in us keeping in in focus, in sharp focus, if I can put it that way. Thank you. Will you answer a couple more really good questions? Of course, of course. Thank you. Um, Kim Benson uh, says, thank you for this brilliant explorative meditation. The Coons Walker comparison is an instant, I have to pronounce this word, ex exegetical classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question, working back from your fascinating contrast of shame and embarrassment, to the central conceptual mode of Hartman and ben Amin and the angel of history, sure, and if so, how might we distinguish between different forms of this dialectic of enlightenment, between messianism and nihilism, iconoclasm and reconstruction, demystification and transformation, if you will, Adorno and ben Amin, or in another historical register, Afro-pessimism and Afro-futurism. Mm -hmm. Perhaps those contrasts are falsely construed or inapt in historical and political application. But if they have force, might they be related to the tension you draw between shame and embarrassment as two forms of perplexity and disquiet, the first seeking retreat from the public sphere in the feeling of failure, the second perhaps seeking radical reorientation to the social and overcoming a vision's blockage that's intrinsic to embarrassment. Mm, wow, well, that's, that's an incredibly rich question and, and thank you, Kim, so much for that. Um, I'll do my best, um, though there's a, there's a lot there, right? I mean, we could go, oh, wow, we could have a really <laughs> rich and, and a very long conversation about all of these things. Um, let me let me find just say a few things. So one one thing I would say is that you know I I, I was fairly in, influenced um, in my thinking um, on Benjamin by uh, a, an excellent book um, uh, by the Franco-Brazilian sociologist uh, Michael Lowy uh, called uh, Redemption and Utopia: um, Jewish lib Jewish Libertarian intellectual thought in Central Europe is I think the subtitle. Um, but one of the things that's interesting to me about that book um, is that uh, Lowy is interested in kind of contextualizing and resituating, uh, you know, Benjamin in a kind of constellation to use the Benjaminian term of, of, of other intellectuals and figures like uh, Franz Rosenzweig and um, uh, Leo Lowenthal and, and, and Kafka, many others, um, who are who are uh, you know kind of working through a number of different themes, um, and whose thought is has this interesting sort of duality in that on the one hand they have a kind of uh, what we might kind of kind of a kind of intellectual protocol, uh, a set of references. Um, that are, I, I would say, paratheological, if we want to put it that, that way, right? I mean, they have connections to kind of thinking, um, you know, to, to um, Kabbalistic thought and, um, and, and sort of currents of Jewish mysticism, for example. Um, but they're also fundamentally, you know, thinking through questions of political philosophy. Um, they're thinking about, you know, the, um, Zionism, for example. Right, and what it would mean to take on the kind of project of um, founding uh, a state. What's involved in that? What's involved in the question of nationalism? How does an ethnos or an ethnic belonging and the question of a nation state connect or, or not connect for, as the case may be? And I think that, you know, I, I guess, you know, and, and this is not a, by any means an original insight, I just wanna make that clear, but I, I do think that there are, perpetually or perennially, in my view, interesting analogies uh, for us in between, you know, currents in that tradition and currents in Black studies, right? Where, I mean, there's a lot of thought in Black studies 
that's very much centered and very much happens, for example, in divinity schools, right? And there's a, 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 a long set of um, kind of arguments and questions about our relationship um, to the theological and to theological thinking. And then a whole, and then of course, questions around politics, political philosophy, sociology, more positivist currents. Um, and then of course, the whole branch that's interested in aesthetics, I mean, it's kind of the whole Lockean branch in a certain kind of way um, that's interested in thinking about uh, the role of our um, of tying together our, our creative and expressive traditions together with our intellectual traditions. And, you know, I, I, I think that what I'm hoping, you know, to, to, to the question of the, the private and the public, um, the personal, uh, uh, personal feelings and affect, you know, a lot of, it's, it's interesting, I would say in general, not just within Black studies, but in the academy more broadly, in literary studies and cultural studies, you know, affect has been a kind of term of reference for some time now. And, you know, we're in a, we're living through a moment in which we're trying to think about how to recon, reconstruct politics itself, how to, because there's a strong sense, I think, and we see it in, um, I would say, the kind of ongoing crisis of our formal politics. I mean, we, we've just uh, a rather alarming and catastrophic um, uh, sign of the decay and decline of our, of our democracy, right? And we're trying to think about certain kinds of political belonging, political efficacy, and, and, and trying to think about how our various aspects of our identity, of our experience, of our past can be integrated in a productive way into a, into a political project and to think about what that project would look like. And, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a, a a final claim to make about that. You know, what I'm trying to do as best I can, I think, uh, and, and hopefully more humbly, is to suggest places we might look and to try and put into relation, Benjamin would say into constellation, right? Uh, works of art, thinkers, um, political and intellectual ideas and currents that hopefully other folks, right, will, uh, you know, Will will meet me and meet others doesn't have to be with me uh, uh, to kind of help us bring as much uh, as much as we can to the to, to the table so that we can think through what I hope we can agree is a moment of crisis and so I you know I just want to say I mean the essay to me is very much that it's right in the, in the French etymological sense it's an attempt it's a proposition it's an it's an experiment to say hey you know here's what I'm thinking about. Uh, I, you know, I hope we can think about this together. I'm not um, laying down a definitive argument or telling or saying to folks, this is how you should think about anything, whether it be Benjamin, Hartman, Kara Walker, or others, but I am proposing these things uh, for us to think together. This is so compelling, fascinating. I, um, I would ask if you don't mind answering two more questions. Jesse. I would love to, yeah. Happy Thank to you. do that. Um, I'll try and be brief. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do you're you're amazing. Um, Take so your time, my brother. Take your time. You're being fabulous. Um Glenda Carpio <laughs> asks, what do you make of the fact that while Walker's work might produce shame and embarrassment, it in itself is far from shame. Think of the sugar baby and her bow down scale and posture. Yeah, well, first of all, so, so uh, excited to uh, get that question from Professor Carpio and, um, and uh, I, you know, it's important for me to note that my thinking on this and my thinking on Walker is indebted to Professor Carpio's reading of Walker and um, and drawing our attention specifically to 
uh, what I think is a, it's a naughty question, this question of um, what's at play, what's at work effectively um, in our responses to the work, in the work itself, um, whether, and I suppose in a sense, whether, whether these things lie or reside within kind of the, the formal qualities of the work, um, the intentionality of the work, which is always a complicated question, or is it our response to the work? Uh, in attempting to answer that question, I think what, what I would say is, is you know, one of, the, one of the reasons why I think um, the Sugar Baby is such an extraordinary um, artwork, art installation, is precisely the, um, this remarkable, um, I don't know if we want to call it incongruity. Uh, it's a really complicated uh, um, and dense uh, kind of intersection of metaphors. Uh, the materiality, the sugar, which is the slave crop. Um, the site within which it's located, the, the industrial factory um, and post-industrial ruin in the gentrifying neighborhood, as Tavi Nyong'o rightly points out, all of which I think contribute to the metaphorical power of the work. There is, um, you might even call them the kind of Afrocentric echoes of the Sphinx itself. And, you know, as I, as I say, you know, I, I mean, drawing on, you know, um, Langston Hughes' The Negro Speaks of Rivers, you know, I think the, the, the ways in which um, the, the figure speaks to a, a deep history of, and, a, and, a, and, a, and also I would say a kind of tr uh, a tradition of thought um, within Black studies and within Black thought um, that uh, it's not only, I would, I would argue about recovering and remembering, but in a certain sense about um, connecting, right? It's, it's this connective work of diaspora, right? Of, of reminding ourselves that um, the civilizations and cultures of the African continent and really all over the world, because in reality, the African diaspora is, is global. It extends not only um, into the Atlantic world, but also into the Indian Ocean. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly a global phenomenon, right? But it's this kind of worlding and worldliness. Um, so there's, there is this inherently powerful and dignified set of symbolisms um, that are, you know, hardly involved in anything like um, shame or, or kind of humor and embarrassment. But at the same time, of course, there is also, I think, an important uh, way in which the sugar baby, you know, is playing on the um, uh, tropes of the mammy, tropes of minstrelsy. They're, they're, they're there as well. And they refuse, in a sense, to, um, to let go of one or the other, right? They, she, and this, to me, I, I think is, this, is the, the, the power of a certain kind of synthesis which to my mind um, is about generating work that, as I say, is inherently turbulent, destabilizing, um, about, you know, faced with, uh, so that when we're faced with it, we really don't know how to feel. <laughs> we don't know how to react appropriately. But that to me is actually the sign of a great work, that, that before it, we are at a loss. And that my hope, my thinking is, is that it's precisely that feeling of why am I at a loss to before this work that hopefully pushes us to think, well, it, maybe it's because there are unresolved, still open things that I need to hope for, that I need to want, that I need to remember, that I need to um, engage with and bring into being uh, politically, affectively, um, interpersonally. Um, um, and, and again, I would say that to me is, is this kind of, if you like, um, Benjaminian, but also Hartman's 
um, invocation of the power of the collective of the chorus, where uh, the, the work of art with its connections to the past and its connections to the archive, to past suffering and pain, but also a kind of, a kind of insolent gaiety, an insolent um, joy and a deep sense of power and self-possession, which the sugar baby, of course, has this inherent dignity, precisely because it has such a, a confident knowledge of its past, um, just you know creates a kind of disruption, a fundamental rupture. I mean, there's something so surreal about that artwork, um, and you know, I would say that, you know, what does it mean for that artwork to show up in 2014? You know, and this is this is a you know kind of my refusal in a sense to let go of historicism, um, and so. You know, I think I think that uh, for me, you know, that I'm still, I guess you would say, a believer in the revolutionary poten potential um, in our tradition and in and in in the work of art. Uh, in that, it's really our our duty not to uh, not to let go of that, but to but but to insist on it and to figure out how to enhance its effect, how to multiply its reach, um, how to double down on that power. Uh, rather than adopt a kind of skepticism towards it. Thank you very much. Um, one final question. David Bindman writes, can I challenge you a little on Jeff Koons? I agreed entirely with you, what you said about Kara Walker, <laughs> but I think there is a case for Koons' work, horrible though it is. <laughs> By working on the edge of art and commerce, doesn't he lure the hedge fund guys to reveal their true emptiness? Um, does he lure the, the hedge fund guys? You know, this is the problem with the troll though, right? I mean, this is the problem, you know, with Donald Trump. I mean, one could say that, you know, Donald Trump helped tro uh, show us, uh, in some sense, the true colors of a large portion of the Demo of, uh, pardon, of the Republican Party, um, both its, its, its unfortunately, its, actual, its, its politicians, its Congress members, um, of its base, um, of a large portion of the country. Uh, you know, is it worth it? You know, is, 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 does that, you know, sort of who's playing who? Right? Are, are the hedge fund guys really being played by Coons or are they playing him? Look, here's what I would say. Um, what bothers me about Coons, and, and I, I, I would argue that Coons is symptomatic. I'm not picking on him. There are any number of, of people, I think, who essentially traffic in, in the, the vein that he's operating in. You know, what I would say is that they, they don't really believe in art. Um, and they don't have, uh, they're not animated by a spiritual and theopolitical project. Um, now, that's not new. That's always, there, there's always been people who made things that exist in the world under the sign of art who are like that. Um, and the fact that massive amounts of capital, um, you know, are willingly accrue around that work is, is not even in itself a, 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 a kind of disqualifying fact, though I do think, I would say again, that there's a kind of, to me, there's a kind of accretion there that is inherently nihilistic. And it's the nihilism, a nihilism which I think is very much in the air in our contemporary moment. Um, you know, we, I'm, I'm not gonna go into a whole thing about what happened at the Capitol right now. We don't have time for that. Um, you know, some people would say that there's a kind of hard thought through ideological right-wing project that's made visible there. I'm not denying that, but I think there's also a profoundly nihilistic a wind blowing through uh, American culture. Um, one that, um, that in some sense the, the, the Coons rabbit speaks to. Um, you know, a, a, a people, those hedge fund guys, 
um, Jeff Koons himself, those people are lost. Um, but you can be lost in a way that's very dangerous. And uh, to the extent that you have power and influence over society, which the hedge fund people have, and which Jeff Koons, to the extent that people are willing to play along and give him power and influence, um, also uh, you know, make that, that work um, potentially dangerous. Um, and you know, again, I, I put those up in opposition to say, as I, as I tend to say in, you know, throughout my essay, you know, if folks are really serious about saying, about looking at our contemporary political situation, and we can, I'm talking here about the national political crisis in the United States of America, the crisis of our democracy. Beyond that, we can also talk about the global crisis of democracy and the crisis, the ecological crisis. If people are serious about confronting these things, I implore you to look at the richness of what black artists are doing and what black thinkers are saying of what the black intellectual tradition has to offer. Um, I'm not saying that other traditions have nothing to offer, but what I am saying is, is that I really do think that, you know, these are questions that our tradition as an intellectual tradition and as an artistic tradition have been proposing answers to for quite some time. And I think that there's, there's hope in that. You know, there, there's, there's hope in Kara Walker's work in where, whereas in Coons's work, I mean, I don't see any, any spark of life. I don't see any spark of hope. And I, I don't want our country, I don't want the world to go his way. I want it to go her way. And so I really hope that folks will, you know, um, you know cut through the noise and, and go to our work not get caught up in questions of shame and outrage, but delve productively into the past, the present, uh, um, engage with black artists, both of the past, not only contemporary artists, I must say, you know, right? Also the, all the art, great artwork of the past, not only our thinkers of the present, but also all of those of the past, because I really do think that we have keys to a way forward and a way out um, and, I, and I do think that there's no way around the problems that we're putting before the country, right? I think there's no way around us. And, and I think that Jeff Koons, you know, whatever he may think, uh, you know, in a certain sense, you know, he hasn't read enough black feminism. He hasn't um, taken seriously um, black art. He hasn't allowed himself to think sufficiently, I think, about, um, about what it, about what, about the, the contribution that African-Americans have made historically and culturally to the country um, whose, whose um, culture he thinks he's signifying on, right? Which, because that's what he thinks that he's doing, um, you know, and the Michael Jackson and all of that stuff. So anyway, I won't go extensively and, and, and dwell on that. I'm not interested overly in, in, in attacking Jeff Koons, I'm more interested in drawing our attention um, to Kara Walker, and, and it's really more, again, just this kind of point of juxtaposition. But I do think it's, it's a stark opposition when you put those two things together. Um, and I think that, you know, um, you know I, I, cre I think there is a positive way forward and, and a negative way that we could go. Um, and I hope that, um, I think that we're called upon to try and um, steer uh, uh, the world in the right direction and steer our country in the right direction. And so to I the would, extent that it's, it's useful to highlight that juxtaposition to get people to think that's, that's what it's there for. Sorry, go ahead. I just, um, I'm going to wrap up and then uh, turn it over to Christian to say goodbye. I just would add a footnote. I don't, uh, not all hedge fund people are the, the same. I mean, some enormously successful hedge fund people were trained here at Harvard as triple AS majors. Um, our patron saint is Glenn Hutchins, you know, who's given over $50 million for, for the Hutchins Center. And we're about to get a, another major um, grant from one of my former students for, um, the, for Black Art, the Cooper, the Cooper Gallery. Um, I just don't think it's useful just to characterize all, all hedge fund managers don't look alike. 
<laughs> I don't think that serves any useful intellectual purpose, but I think David was being I, I metaphorical. I, I, I just said, I think David was being metaphorical. I, I completely <laughs> agree. No, no Jesse, I'll just say, I'll love, just say though that, right, uh, I mean, the Hushin Center, um, funds and buys a lot of black art um, and not so much coons. And I think that's all to the good. Yeah, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Look, let me add one other thing. You're right that if we're not in a renaissance, uh, we're certainly in the most remarkable period of, of creativity in the history of African-American art, uh, far beyond anything that was created in the Harlem Renaissance in terms of quantity. And we celebrate that in a new film, a new documentary that will air on HBO on February 9th. It's called Black Art uh, in the Absence of Light, which I've uh, uh, produced and Sam Pollard has directed and Thelma Golden is the consultant. Sarah Lewis um, and Mary Smith Campbell and Rick Powell are um, two of the key um, interviewees. But we go into a dozen artist studios and interview them in their studios while they're creating. And obviously, Kara Walker is, is one of those people. And I encourage you all uh, to see it. Maybe we can have a little mini seminar about it. Anyway, Jesse, brilliant. Uh, Krishna, take us away. We have to welcome our new fellows in the, our next Zoom meeting. Ernie, you did a great job. Uh, don't sign that dotted line till, you know, make a pay, baby. <laughs> Krishna, all yours. Yes, well, thank you very much, Jesse, for this really, really fascinating talk. And I can't wait till the book comes out. Is that coming out next month or? Yes, it's coming out uh, first week of March. Okay, wonderful. We'll have to get many copies for the Hutchins Center. And thank you so much, Ernest, for your Wonderful introduction and good luck with everything. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you both.